how many times in your life you have been asked to take a decision rationally? Don't get emotional. You might have been told. Or your views were not taken seriously because they were told they are too emotional. Emotions and passions get a bad reputation in our society. They are disruptive, they are dangerous, they are childish, they are feminine. They are supposed to be relegated to literature and art, to the Hollywood rom-coms. They are not supposed to be part of the rational discourses that have some meaning. Um, and they are certainly not the kind of the stuff that a science is made of. So that's what exactly I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you how science is emotional. Now, it somewhere started in 17th century, uh, at the beginning of the what is called enlightenment philosophy, with this particular dictum called, I think, therefore I exist. Raise your hand if you haven't heard this dictum. Everybody has. I probably one where well, well, you will hear very soon. You are here in this uh, environment. Um, so it was the um, you know the French philosopher, mathematician, scientist René Descartes who said that I think therefore I exist. Right? Wrong. He actually said I doubt therefore I think therefore I exist. What Descartes was very afraid was of doubting. He wanted to expel all doubts by creating knowledge, and per particularly by creating perfect knowledge. So he actually created the binary between body and mind, and he assigned the faculty of thinking to the mind and asked the faculty of the thinking to produce perfect knowledge in order to all expel all the doubts and then feel very certain about his existence. But then there was a little problem there, that how to really produce perfect perfect knowledge. He can produce the knowledge, but who is going to tell this is the perfect knowledge? Now, perfect knowledge here meant true knowledge, because in 17th century, the scientists were not worried about producing good knowledge or a bad knowledge or a right knowledge or a wrong knowledge. Uh, they were actually worried about producing correct knowledge or the true knowledge, the, the knowledge not which is producing error or mistake, because how shameful and embarrassing it would be if my knowledge has mistakes. Now, Descartes actually did a very nice thing. He said the God's agency, the non-deceiving eternal agency of God is going to produce perfect knowledge. Now, it might sound a little strange, actually, now sitting in this universität, um, that the God is going to grant the, the perfect knowledge. But remember that this was the 17th century. It was a sometime around 1625. God was everywhere. Not that the university and church were inseparable, but university was located inside the church. Now, something happened in three centuries. In 19th century, God died. We, we, we killed God. The modern science and religion got separated. They acquired the opposite side of the spectrum in a way that modern science actually declared everything that is related to God or the God's agency as a superstition. And um, at that time, now the problem again arises that how then are we going to grant truth to knowledge? And this actually responsibility was then assigned internally to the science. It's a science logic, it's empiricism, it's mathematics, um, it's, it's instruments such as the microscopes and telescopes. They were actually assigned the responsibility to produce correct knowledge. But that was not enough. Because this was the time, actually, another movement that arises that is called logical positivism. What does it mean? It completely redefined the idea of what is science. So as per the logical positivism, they said that any statements that is based only on empirical evidences and the statements that does not involve any personal opinion, any emotions, any personal bias, any worldview, any metaphysics, they were the only true scientific statements. And that's why they were called positive science. Now, in order to produce, actually, this kind of a knowledge, which was then termed as an objective science. Now, this is the idea of the objectivity that most of the scientists sitting in this room understand that was born around that time. Now, this objective science, supposed to be the true science, actually was then declared not having any emotions, not having any personal opinions, any introspection, any, in, any intuition. All these actually were considered hindering the science, and they were removed 
moved actually from what was considered as a positive or true science, and that's how the science became unemotional. Now, we all scientists sitting in this room actually are the children of positive, uh, logical positivism, because we have been told actually that our science must be unbiased, means that it must have nothing personal actually involved in that. Um, now, Look at that, actually, because I would say that that is a textbook idea of science. That is the science how it is idealized it should be done. Now, what happened is that in the last half a century, there is this field which is called scientific biographies actually exploded, meaning the number of very prominent scientists, number of biographies have come out. And these biographies actually paint a completely different picture of how scientists do science actually in their lives. So what I'm going to do is that in the remaining of my talk, in three different ways I'm going to derive from this literature on scientific biographies and to, to, to show you how science is emotional. So in a very first way, actually, a number of scientists described how doing science actually produces very intense embodied emotions. Let's take a very famous example. Darwin. Darwin said that he felt like a mad gambler, addicted to doing science, that he felt that the doing science was very compulsive for him. On the other hand, Einstein, actually he said that he actually gave the finishing touches to the theory of general relativity by sitting down on piano. He was playing music when it became clear to him how to conclude his, his theory of relativity. Um, he, Einstein also said that he saw the forces and the volumes moving in space and time, but only when the, he could make them as a part of his body and his sensory experience that he could write a formula about it. And I can go on and on. Michael Polanyi, a mathematician philosopher, he said that doing mathematics was like a passion for him, like a longing, like he cannot do without it. A, a historian of science, actually, Donovan Schaefer, he has recently written a book called uh, Feeling Science. And in this book, actually, Schaefer describes how uh, when we do science, when we are exploring knowledge, actually, somewhere we have this very micro-level delight, the feeling of something, a subtle click coming together. I mean, all the people doing science here must have experienced that. You know, you conclude a paper, you conclude an experiment. There is this deep sense of satisfaction that emerges, actually, somewhere that will, oh, wow, we can sleep night tonight very well. Now, this is the idea of, you know, the one side of the one spectrum of the, uh, the, the intense emotion that science produces, but there is also other side of it, that sometimes producing knowledge could be very traumatic. It could actually produce very deep suffering. It can be very torturous. It is not very uncommon to find the cases in which the scientists become high naive maniac or they are clearly driven to having even a suicidal thoughts. Now, whatever side of the spectrum your own embodied experience of doing science may be, but the one thing is very clear that this literature shows that the individual scientist is not this dispassionate, rational person collecting empirical evidences and building theories. This person is a fundamentally feeling, suffering, experiencing individual. Thinking feels. Thinking is feeling. Thinking and feeling cannot be separated. This is what Donovan Schaefer says in his book. This is what I argued in my own book that was published in 2018. Now, one thing I'd like to bring here, um, Schaefer actually does a very interesting thing. He actually looks at the contemporary neuroscience, and he says that our model of the brain is so that both emotions and cognition emerge from the same source. It is actually part of the same neural network that they cannot be separated. If one is damaged, the other one is damaged too. So here I'd like to point out this whole popular image about our brain actually having a left side and the right side, and the left side being emotion, right side being rational. One is being womanly or feminine, the other one is masculine, which is and this is because of public debate, I should use a very civilized language, all bullshit. 
so now actually I would like to tell you the second way because when the scientists say that doing science is very intense emotionally uh, embodied experience personally for me it's not enough because generally in this literature that particular place where the bug stops and it is very superficial I tell you why because a scientist called you know uh, Joseph Mengele, who conducted a very horrendous experiments on the bodies of the prisoners of Auschwitz, and on the other hand, a Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist Barbara McClintock, who actually revolutionized the whole genetic science by her holistic thinking, they both might be feeling very elated about their own findings. They both might probably be sitting down on piano and giving finishing touches to their findings. So how do we recognize then when we induct feeling actually in doing science that we are doing good science, that the person who is doing science is also a well-meaning individual? And this is where here, actually, we need to now unpack the person who is doing science, his or her personality, and the science being done, actually, to open the black box here and to understand how emotions are being incorporated into doing science. So let me try. These two things I'm going to try before I end. And the first thing is actually how we unpack the person who does the science and the scientist and what comes out of it. Let's take the example of Darwin. So Darwin actually, um, uh, there's a whole biography written on Darwin actually, which says that the Darwin was, uh, his, uh, his whole response, his whole evolutionary science was a response to his hatred for slavery. Darwin was very disturbed by actually at that time, this humanity divided into 15 different races. And these races at that time were called different species. And then some races were declared as a superior to other races and Darwin was so so uh, disturbed by it that he wanted to rescue the unity of the humanity idea by his evolutionary thinking. But now there's a little detail here. So Darwin actually completed the, uh, the outline of his theory of evolution uh, in 1840s, um, so the early 1840s. But he kept the manuscript in his drawer for two decades. His manuscript was actually published in 1859. Why was that? Because he was so worried that his actually views are going to disturb, particularly his wife, his relationship with his wife and other relatives in a way that he was not willing to get his, his manuscript out. Now, Darwin actually published this book called Origin of the Species, and then he published another book, um, which was published in 1871, called Descent of the Man. Now, in origin, actually, he questions the racial differences. In descent, he affirms them. Darwin never used the term white or Anglo-Saxon in his entire work, but he referred to people who are non-white, non-Anglo-Saxon as savages. Now, which of these Darwin is a real Darwin? both of them. And that is where actually I would like to say that the scientist, the emotional scientist, it a heterogeneous personality. It is a self-contradiction. This is a person actually who is always emerging. It is not given in time and space, but it emerges, it changes all the time along with doing science. So that's the first thing we learn from doing science as emotional. Now, similarly, we need to also apply the similar framework in order to open what is called the black box of doing science and show how emotions are incorporated in the content of science, how the way the problem of what kind of problem can be investigated, what is the hypothesis that we have built, what kind of method we choose, what is considered as a valid empirical evidence is how they are turned into conclusions and what kind of theories are being built. The entire process of doing science needs to be unpacked and to show that the how emotions are incorporated in doing this whole process of science. And I found that extremely hard. In my own book, which was published in 2018, I actually looked at the way in which the scientists' subjectivity relate to their objective science in doing the history of the concept of the gene over the 20th century. And I must have read some 25 biographies before I chose five biographies in order to apply this biographical method in my, res my, in my book, actually, to show how science is emotional. And it is very hard to do that. So this is somewhere a lot of work still needs to be done. 
So towards the end, I would like to read a line which is quoted in Schaefer's book. This is the psychologist, Sylvan Tompkins. He says that he felt, when he was writing a particular essay, he felt like he was having a love affair with the idea. And when I read that, came another line in my mind, actually. It is from the poem written by Marina Svateva, not speaking that name correctly. Um, she says that love is like a bowstring pulled to the point of breaking. So I'd like to invite you to conduct your research, your science, like you are having a passionate love affair. And don't be afraid to pull the bowstring as far as possible to the point of breaking. Otherwise, it's not love. Thank you. <laughs>